Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette, uh, board certified obesity medicine and family medicine physician. And I'm James O'Hara, family nurse practitioner. And today we're revisiting a topic, doing kind of a reshoot of something we did in the past just with a new and improved audio and video setup. So it'll be fun to dive into this topic again with uh, maybe some updated information as well. Uh, so our topic today is going to be you know, testosterone boosting for men and women, and then specifically we're going to talk about Tonkatali, Fidogia agrestis, and some other supplements people are taking to accomplish this. So um, how should we kick things off? Or I suppose first we should remember to tell people what it is we do on this podcast. This is where we give you the tools to design a balanced approach to your own health, and uh, each person is individual, so whether we're talking about testosterone hormones like we are today or preventing um, cancer or cardiovascular disease on other podcasts. Um, it comes down to your uh, nature and nurture, so both your genetics and your lifestyle. So um, there's a lot of uh, like debate and questions and one of the most common questions that we get is what supplement should we take or what medication we should take. And all of that is down to your own individual situation. So there's no perfect diet, there's no perfect supplement, there's not a cookie cutter regimen of medications and supplements that we put people on. It just depends. Yeah, and I figure we start with supplements because everyone asks, so how do I boost my testosterone? And really, most of it comes down to how you're eating, how you're sleeping, you're exercising, your you know, body fat percentage. Um, but people want to know, you know, oh, well, if I'm doing these things, what do I take? So we'll start there. Uh, but then we certainly will touch on uh, the more important aspects as well. So I think the two most popular supplements that are on the market right now in, in terms of single ingredient products would be Tonkat Ali and then Fidogia Agrestis. And they're similar but different. It's interesting because Tonkat Ali has a lot of studies, um, a lot of data backing up its efficacy, not mm -hmm. just in animal models, but also in the human model. And then Fidogia Agrestis has, I think, three studies total in preclinical rodent models and then zero studies, uh, as far as we know, that have been published in humans up to this point. So with Tonka Ali, you see a couple of different things. Um, it has some properties for testosterone boosting. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about how it accomplishes that. Some people say, oh, it's a CIRM. Some people say it's an aromatase inhibitor. So we'll kind of debunk those and talk about the actual mechanism of action there. Uh, and what's realistic to expect? You know, is someone going to get a 2,000 level of testosterone from Tonkat Ali? Yeah, probably not. So in terms of the, the mechanism and perhaps even the differences in the varieties of Tonkat, let's go ahead and start there. Yeah, so Tonkat Ali is the same thing as Long Jack. And there's a couple different ways that you can standardize this. Most of the studies are done on a normal standardization where you have you know, around 1.5 to 2% of uricominones, um, which is a compound that acts on a couple different steroidogenesis enzymes. Actually very similar enzymes that insulin and IGF-1 help upregulate. So many people are familiar with if you, you know, if you cut your calories down really severely and you're already a low body fat percentage, um, you know, you're, you're borderline in starvation mode, a natural bodybuilder would be a great example of this then often you have very low testosterone levels. And also people are familiar with, if you go on a ketogenic diet, you have less insulin signaling, which can be of course a good thing, but it can also decrease your free testosterone. So the, the less activity you have at those enzymes, the better Tonkat can help. There's a couple different ways that you can standardize it. So you can try to um, standardize to a higher content of the um, likely active compounds, but there's also sap, there's other, other saponins in there other than uricominones. So anytime that you're taking away from the natural standardization, it could shift the mechanism of action. Yeah, and I think that's important because in, let's say, you know, traditional um, Asian or Chinese medicine, this has been used for libido boosting purposes, for fertility purposes, yep. things like that for you know, many centuries now. And they're not, you know, extracting uricominones back in the 1800s. So that full spectrum, there's something to be said there that it, probably you're going to have a mix of effects. And that's one of the major differences between a supplement and a pharmaceutical is that it's going to yep. be very narrowly targeted if you're talking about a pharmaceutical, whereas you tend to have a dirtier mechanism of action when you're talking about supplements. Mm -hmm. 
So with the Tonkat Elite, the main thing that we're looking for is an increase in testosterone. And that's going to come largely from the increase in the steroidogenesis from the supplement. Now, to kind of get into, well, why do people think that it's an aromatase inhibitor or a um, estrogen receptor modulator? This actually comes from some of the preclinical data, which doesn't always translate directly to the human studies. For example, when they give this to mice, um, actually it has fairly poor bioavailability orally. Um, so they do an intraperitoneal injection and they saw that it's able to oppose the effects of ethanol estradiol on the endometrial lining. So this is the same reason that you have a progestin in a oral contraceptive because you don't want unopposed estrogen. So it acts as a serm if it's injected into the abdomen of a mouse it doesn't act as a serum necessarily if you're taking it by mouth. The data hasn't been looked at there in humans. Now, there may be some potential that it could act as a serum and have some efficacy in things like uh, endometriosis, for example, opposing some of the estrogen in that estrogen-dependent tissue. Uh, but we really don't see any evidence of it acting like an aromatase inhibitor, other than it has some overlap with you know, ant anti-estrogenic effects on different breast, uh, mm -hmm. breast cancer cell lines in vitro. Um, so in humans, it actually increases testosterone and estradiol, um, and an aromatase inhibitor would not have that same effect. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see the, the bro science of mechanisms of actions of supplements. So you see this with DIM as well, which is widely popularized as an aromatase inhibitor. And you also see this with things like ashwagandha. Thinking about Tonkat and even uh, Fidoja and ashwagandha as well, a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the benefit from it, and a lot of the like uh, push to study this comes from the area where it is used in traditional medicine. I believe in the Indian subcontinent, it's called Arudavayak medicine, and a lot of the study on different varieties of ashwagandha, both root and stem varieties, come from research labs in that area. The same can be said of Tonkat. You see labs in Indonesia and Malaysia and Southeast Asia studying that very frequently. Um, I guess the same isn't necessarily true of Fidoja, but that's used in traditional medicine in the African subcontinent. So you have these different um, compounds that come from very different areas of the world, but they have very uh, similar generational knowledge built up regarding their efficacy. Yeah, and it's interesting because sometimes you'll see something like that and there's a expectation effect. So people will take something with the expectation that it's going to improve fertility, vitality, etc. cetera. Uh, this may even, even be something we see with testosterone where someone with normal testosterone goes to a, a testosterone milk clinic, they get put on testosterone and they're like, you know, wow, this is great stuff. Uh, I think there's a bit of an expectation effect surrounding that, just to give another example. Um, but, you know, natural medicine certainly has its place. You just have to be mindful of a lot of those overlapping targets because it's, uh, like I said, a, a dirtier mechanism of action. So when we talk about the, you know, benefits of Tonkatoli, it, it's mainly going to be raising testosterone. And people want to raise testosterone for different reasons. Um, usually it's for either athletic performance or increasing lean body mass. Um, sometimes it can be a sense of motivation, how you feel kind of the... Um, you know, the mascot of testosterone has been, it, it makes effort feel good. And even if you raise testosterone within the reference range, that does convey some benefit. So you'll see sometimes some misinformation about, oh, well, as long as your testosterone is in the normal reference range, um, you know, you're not going to see any benefit. And that's not exactly true because we've seen when people have exogenous testosterone, I think it was a gel that was used in this particular study, but even different dosages that landed people in the reference range, you did see an improvement in mm -hmm. lean body mass. So, you know, there's more variables at play, you know, androgen receptor sensitivity, which we'll talk a bit about, but um, you shouldn't believe people that kind of have an all or nothing approach to that, because there can be small changes that over time can lead to a big difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of the side effects, um, that's something that we always discuss. So, you know, is Tonkatoli safe? You know, what side effects could it cause, um, either indirect or by its direct mechanism of action? Those are things that we look at very carefully because we don't want to market something or 
or tell people, oh, this medication or this supplement can never have any side effects because it's natural or because it's been tested by pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies. So what are some of those things? Tonkat is one of the safer supplements. There was one study out of, I believe, Indonesia that looked at Malaysian Tonkat, so definitely uh, a little bit of a bias there, conflict of interest, but um, there was concern about heavy metal content in the raw that came from Malaysia. So that's why a lot of companies will specifically state Indonesian source for their Tonkat. Um, however, outside of that, the direct mechanisms of action, um, anytime you increase your androgen or your insulin, then um, you could potentially have more acne or more hair loss. Um, but that's likely an insignificant effect because this is not going to make, in most people, it's not going to make a huge difference. Yeah, so things like you know acne, hair loss, things that are thought of as being androgenic can certainly happen. There's always some non-specific effects. Um, one that's actually noted in a couple of the trials is fatigue, and that's typically the first week of taking the supplement. Um, why exactly that's happening, it's not clear. It could be an effect on cortisol. You do tend to see those kind of uh, mm -hmm. balance each other out with you know higher testosterone. You see cortisol suppressed to some degree in some cases. But there's other things like upset stomach, or dizziness, or headache, and those really don't make a whole lot of sense with the mechanism. So they could be coincidental, or they could be one person's reaction to a substance or the uricuminones in that supplement. So it, it's generally safe. Uh, it's been studied up to six months at fairly high doses, 600 to 800 milligrams. Don't see any kidney damage, liver damage, no changes to like your red blood cell count, things that you see with exogenous testosterone, for example. Mm -hmm. Occasionally you will see different concentrations of Tonkat and um, for different concentrations it's just harder to monitor like what the bioavailability would be, what the equivalent dosing would be. Occasionally we do use a different dosing, but uh, sticking to the standard dosing in general is your best bet if you're trying to um, go by um, like the most commonly used study and the, most, the best evidence that you have available to you. Good rule of thumb for Tonkat is the less insulin and IGF-1 signaling you have, so if you're in a big caloric deficit or if you're like a, a ketogenic dieter or you just have lower insulin and IGF-1 at baseline, the more helpful it will be. Yeah, we chatted about that a bit in the previous episode where we talked about, you know, if somebody's taking metformin, they're going to improve their insulin sensitivity, getting rid of that excess glucose and reactive oxygen species that are secondary to that. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to help with late cell function in the long term. Yep. But it basically does put the brakes on that same steroidogenesis cascade that the Tonkat Ali is going to be pushing back against. So it could be a nice synergistic intervention there if somebody's using a supplement medication for insulin sensitivity, and then also you know addressing that steroidogenesis with something like Tonkat Ali. Um, and I don't think we should neglect talking about the, the TRT and Tonkat rats. I just remembered that from the last podcast. Uh, there was a study where they, you know, castrated rats and then put them on testosterone replacement therapy and then added Tonkat Ali supplementation. And they did see an increase in the size of the levator anti-muscle. It's a commonly, um, it's a common target for androgenic or anabolic activity of mm -hmm. um, the anabolic activity of different compounds. So I thought that was particularly interesting. You know, does Tonkat Ali have an additional anabolic effect in people, you know, for example, who are on testosterone replacement? Um, the answer is I don't know, because I don't see a lot of people who are on testosterone taking Tonkat Ali. Probably wouldn't be a huge effect size, uh, but it's an interesting study, and that's what we do is read interesting studies and bring them up. Mm -hmm. If Tonkat did have a significant effect, then one of its mechanisms might be its action on SHBG. If you look at the different studies, and SHBG again is sex hormone binding globulin, the protein that binds androgens to estrogens. Um, the higher your SHBG, it's more likely that Tonkat will decrease it. Again, kind of mimicking how high insulin levels will help decrease your SHBG. So it's been studied in uh, females as well, and they took a group of females that had very normal SHBGs and they did not move significantly. Um, a, lo a lot of studies are designed like this. However, if they had selected a different group to study, um, then they would likely have seen more of an effect. Yeah, and I think it's important to note Tom Cattley works in younger men, older men and also in women for raising testosterone levels. 
Um, the newest study that I'm aware of showed about a 20% increase in both testosterone and estradiol levels, mm -hmm. again, in that 600 to 800 milligram dosing range. Uh, but just because that's where it was studied doesn't mean you can't start with a lower dose, track your either subjective improvements or objective improvements on the blood work. And I believe that brings us to Fidoja. So Fidoja has uh, an additional unique mechanism where it can potentially increase luteinizing hormone. Um, and this is definitely seen in the preclinical models, and both of us have reviewed a lot of blood work of people taking one or both of these supplements. Um, and I wouldn't say every single time, but there have certainly been 50% you know, or so cases where you do see a significant increase in the level of luteinizing hormone, and then downstream of that, an increase in the testosterone level. So I think that effect is preserved in humans. We just don't have a high quality randomized trial to kind of sort that out because, you know, as we mentioned, it has zero studies as of right now in humans, but I think that there will be studies done just because there's such a major commercial interest in this um, and then more and more people are taking it. So one thing that we did look at was testicular toxicity and that is seen at certain dosages in the preclinical models. So the human mouse equivalent there is something like 250 milligrams is kind of your upper safe limit of daily intake. Uh, but then people are like, well, I want to take more. So I don't recommend that people take more, but if they do, then we talk about, you know, risk mitigation. And there's a couple theories about this um, relating to reactive oxygen species, oxidative damage, and some potential ways to mitigate those. So perhaps we talk a bit about that. Definitely. So when you're thinking about the toxicity of a not very well studied compound, however, a compound with a very long history of human use in traditional medicine, you're trying to find the mechanism of action of toxicity. And there's actually papers on Fidoja agrestis. By the way, there is other species in the Fidoja genus that's very interesting um, for hormone and testosterone optimization. Agrestis is just getting a lot of attention right now, perhaps because of our friend, uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman and also Derek with More Plates, More Dates, um, and even Joe Rogan. But uh, with specifically with Fidoja agrestis, there are studies that say it is an antioxidant and it helps improve spermatogenesis in the testes. And I believe that's also a rat study. I believe that's from August. We'll, uh, we'll link these, of course. And there's also studies, um, there's kind of like a group of studies that looked at different doses of Fidoja agrestis, and they looked at increasing um, markers of oxidative stress, like alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT and ALKFOS. And those can increase. However, when you look at um, labs, and often we do check these for individuals that are on Fidoja agrestis, it's actually pretty seldom that you see those increase. However, there's a, there can be a decrease in the testicular size. It's not, uh, it's correlated with the changes in ALKFOS or GGT. However, we don't know if that's causatory. It could also be that the efficiency of the testes, both for testosterone production and spermatogenesis improves. So the uh, size could potentially decrease. Yeah, it's some interesting theories. And like I said, we're excited to see more research in this specific area. So the way that they have shown testicular toxicity from various compounds to be mitigated in animal models, usually with uh, antioxidants and sometimes very high doses of antioxidants, like uh, what would be the equivalent of, I don't know, something like 500 grams of taurine in a human. Yep. Uh, but in acetylcysteine seems to have a fairly potent effect at a lower dose. Um, one thing I do want to be cautious of is not necessarily overstating the benefits of antioxidants and extrapolating those from animals to humans. Because if you give you know, a mouse vitamin C, for example, at high doses, it's going to ameliorate cardiovascular disease, which we know is not the case for humans. They're, the way they develop cardiovascular disease is a little bit different than ours. And it's usually cancer that's going to be the leading cause of you know, rodent death in a lab versus um, cardiovascular disease in humans. But mm -hmm. Um, there have been studies with taurine that mitigate testicular toxicity. Doses are pretty high there. There have been doses, studies with N-acetylcysteine that also mitigate testicular toxicity. Usually these are with heavy metal exposure or 
with things like um, anabolic steroids that they're giving to these mice and looking at testicular effects, uh, probably for some of the early research to try to develop a male contraceptive, something like that. Uh, but the N-acetylcysteine seems to be something that could potentially push back a little bit against any extra oxidative stress you're having there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a direct precursor for glutathione. We know those levels decrease with age and people's capacity for dealing with that oxidative damage decreases with age. Um, and there was a study earlier this year, I think they used glycine and N-acetylcysteine and um, this was in older adults and they saw you know, the improvements, reductions just like you would expect in that oxidative stress and damage. So we have some pretty solid data to base that on. Um, we do recommend also people you know, taking breaks and so not just taking high doses of Fidocia agrestis year round because with exposure to any compound, it's gonna be the dose and the duration that either make the medicine or the poison. So you know, just being reasonable, being more on the conservative side, you know, taking maybe three weeks on, one week off, or one week on, one week off. Uh, there's different ways to do it and then perhaps um, supplementing that with a little bit of antioxidant support typically in um, N-acetylcysteine or an uh, ethyl ester N-acetylcysteine which is a newer compound that we've seen some companies having on the market. Yeah that's a good summary. Um, I'd say the top three along with NAC would be taurine which we mentioned or ursodiol and they have a taurine ursodiol combo known as Tudka as well. So um, that's also used for other like inflammatory conditions. So those would be some things to consider. A general dosing would be 300 milligrams or less per day with a three to one uh, ratio or more conservative. So like three weeks on, one week off, perhaps three months on, one month off for some individuals, especially if they're getting labs. And of course, doing this in concert with your healthcare provider. Absolutely. Uh, and now we get to talk about the lifestyle interventions, which people tend to find not as exciting for some reason. I, I guess it's just not as easy. Um, but we can start with sleep because that's when you're going to have your peak testosterone levels during sleep. You have your biggest LH surge in the early morning hours. I suppose this would be around 4 a.m. if you're getting up at 7 or 8. Um, this is usually during your rapid eye movement or REM phase of sleep where you're dreaming. So. Sleep has a bigger effect on your recovery from exercise, like your improvements in lean body mass, than I would say it does on your testosterone levels. Um, it can certainly lower your testosterone levels. You know, if somebody has a week of sleep deprivation, we've mm -hmm. seen the studies there, uh, but it's not a 90% you know, reduction in your testosterone. It's gonna kind of be a slow bleed down and you may see a 20 or 25% decrease in those levels. But the effects that you're going to see on your recovery and your cognitive function and your motivation are going to be dramatic. Um, so getting good night's sleep and setting up circadian biology, which again, as you mentioned, Andrew Huberman, he's done a great job of getting more people to pay attention to just how important it is to kind of get into a routine and maintain that consistency so that you're functioning and not trying to fight against what your body's naturally programmed to do. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of polysomnograms or sleep studies. If you have a uh, if you have poor sleep and you have symptoms like uh, very tired during the day, feeling like you have to take a nap, also waking up at night or feeling like you're short of breath at night, um, or if you just have uh, like high hemoglobin, hematocrit, and low testosterone and no other cause, it is certainly reasonable to do a sleep study. They can do sleep studies at home as well. I would say this is on uh, the top three list for causes of low or suboptimal testosterone. Yeah, and sleep apnea is something that is really, I think, underdiagnosed with the prevalence of people with obesity. Um, if you look at some of the more conservative estimates there, there may be 30 million Americans with sleep apnea. If you look at some of the studies that show higher incidence in obese populations, that could be as high as 60 million, and we certainly don't have 60 million people treated for sleep apnea. Of note, if you have low testosterone or hypogonadism and you have sleep apnea, then that is reversible if you improve the sleep apnea or even just decrease the body fat and the fat within the tissue of your neck and throat. And if you start TRT in order to address that, that will almost certainly make your sleep apnea worse where you either need to start a CPAP if you're not on one already or get an oral appliance in some cases or have a consult with an ENT or um, increase the settings or change the settings of your CPAP. 
Yeah, important considerations for people. That's why yeah, it's not as simple as see a testosterone that's low, give it testosterone. It really affects a number of different body systems and even your sleep biology. Um, so get good sleep, set up a routine. You know, seven to nine hours is kind of the sweet spot there. Um, tracking your sleep with something objective like a, you know, uh, Aura Ring, Apple Watch, Biostrap, there's a Whoop, you know, tons of different devices out there. And using the same tool consistently is probably going to be more important at this point in time than, you know, having the best device out there, just so that you can see how X intervention affects Y, your sleep. So um, next we have exercise. So exercise can raise testosterone levels acutely, but those acute changes in hormone levels aren't necessarily what drives the outcome. So you'll see, for example, you know, a meal, somebody will eat a high calorie meal and that's gonna decrease testosterone level for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But that's not what is driving the outcome. So you shouldn't just never eat because it lowers testosterone or your testosterone will fall due to that. Um, but you know we need food and protein and protein synthesis for anabolism. So I wouldn't get hung up on the intraday fluctuations, um, you know, to talk a bit about the timing of testosterone collection, that should be early morning on an empty stomach before you have a meal that could you know, decrease that and give you a, a falsely lower reading. But the exercise programs that have been shown to increase testosterone, they typically involve um, large compound movements, um, not overtraining, um, but not undertraining either. So if you see someone who is training every day, resistance training and cardio, um, very low body fat, you're more than likely gonna see a low testosterone map person. And that's why I don't think either one of us are really surprised when you see influencers who are mm -hmm. showing their results. They have um, you know, a phenomenal physique, a lot of lean body mass, but low testosterone levels. Um, and I think that's important for people to realize that you can still make a lot of progress, you know, regardless of where your testosterone level is. Uh, but it's important to be mindful of your training volume and your progression, making sure you just have smart programming so that, you know, for one, you don't get injured, um, get overtraining injuries, and for two, to support a, a healthier hormone profile where you'll probably feel better. The correlation between your testosterone levels and your physique is actually relatively weak for, especially if uh, you're natural. But even for people on uh, replacement as well, or even on more than replacement, it is a relatively weak correlation. And some of that we'll talk about androgen receptor sensitivity and density, but a lot of it has to do with the lifestyle. So it's like if you're building a sandcastle, whether it's a medication or a supplement, it's literally just a tool to help you do so. It can certainly be helpful in optimizing your natural testosterone from 300 to 600 is certainly helpful. Now, going from 600 to 900 may or may not be that helpful much less helpful than going from 300 to 600. Yeah, and if you're looking at the general population, I mean, you're not going to see a strong correlation there. Um, but as we kind of mentioned earlier, within an individual, if I take that individual and like they have that 300 to 600 increase, yep. they're going to see probably improvements in how they feel day to day, uh, probably improvements in lean body mass, athletic performance, their ability to recover from exercise. Now, does that mean if I see someone with a level of 300 and they feel terrific that I have to raise their level? Absolutely not, no, because there's different levels of sensitivity and some people are performing well, feeling like they're on top of the world with a level of 300. And in that case, you know, I don't need to do anything because they are already exactly where they need to be. Yeah, uh, here, I guess here's a top three list. This is more aimed at scientists or clinicians, but Top three list of understanding um, variations in symptomatology and objective hormone levels. Number one would just be free hormones. So other than free testosterone, there's obviously free estradiol, free cortisol, free thyroid hormones, free HF1, free in total everything. And then number two would be the density of the receptor itself. So whether it's the, just like the genetic density of your insulin receptor or IGF1 receptor, or the sensitivity of your receptor. So the sensitivity of your uh, IGF receptors, the sensitivity of your androgen receptor. So if you think, keep those three things in mind, it will uh, make the symptomatology of the total hormone level make a lot more sense. 
Yeah, I think that's a great way to frame it and, and put it in context. And that's something that people can certainly research because people are always asking us either in person at conferences or on social media, you know, how can I learn about hormones? And having a good framework like that to work off of with every type of hormone, um, I think is a great place for most people to start. Agreed. Um, it, it's more of a, uh, it seems esoteric at first, so it seems like it wouldn't matter clinically, but it, tr it truly does matter clinically. So whether it's estrogen or cortisol or thyroid or any androgen, think about um, what proteins are binding it, whether it's SHBG or thyroxine binding globulin or the, I or the IGF binding peptides. And then think about what receptors it has. Is it just one receptor, like the androgen receptor? Is it like five different receptors, like estrogen receptors? Is it the, um, like which progesterone receptor? And then also think about the um, gene transcription. So whether that's density or sensitivity of the receptor itself. Yeah, and we'll probably reshoot that podcast as well with our new and improved audio setup. So that'll be a fun one to dive into again. Mm -hmm. um, and our next sort of pillar of testosterone is diet. And I think this is probably the most important one in terms of lifestyle. So if I'm looking at the average person in the population where 60, 70% of people are overweight or with obesity, uh, if I just put someone on calorie restriction, they're going to see testosterone levels go up. Mm -hmm. And probably the macronutrient that has the strongest effect on this is going to be dietary fat. So if somebody goes on a low fat diet, and we've both seen this in blood work from patients that we've reviewed, you know, low fat diets are not going to be congruent with someone's goal of increasing testosterone endogenously. Now, there was an interesting study I looked at, I believe this was from last year, 2021, um, and I just came across it this past week or so, but they looked at basically middle-aged gym bros. So these were trained uh, men in their 40s and 50s, and their basal testosterone levels were something like 550, roughly, nanogram per deciliter. Uh, and they had a good amount of lean body mass. Their body fat was around something like 15 or 16 percent. They weren't particularly unhealthy, as far as we know. Don't have a whole lot of information about their baseline health characteristics, but paints a pretty good picture of someone who's in better health than the average person in the population. Mm -hmm. Probably why their total testosterone was something like 550 instead of 450. Uh, but this study was trying to see whether there was a effect from the ketogenic diet specifically or just a low carb, high fat diet on testosterone levels. Mm -hmm. So they were speculating because a lot of people think that there's something you know, magical about the ketogenic state. So they had 5% carbohydrate and the other was 15% carbohydrate. And I believe the fat was something like uh, 60, 65% plus in both cases. So quite a high fat wow. diet which is needed for you know, getting into ketogenesis, but just because you're eating that much fat doesn't mean you're gonna be in ketogenesis depending on the carbohydrate load. And what they saw was essentially no differences in the amount of increase in testosterone. So they were in a slight calorie deficit, but their testosterone levels went up about 200 points, 200 nanogram per deciliter, which is a big shift. Um, and free testosterone also improved. Now, I think a majority of that benefit was from the calorie deficit, um, but the high fat diet mm -hmm. also seems to promote testosterone production. Um, more important to look at healthy sources of fat instead of, you know, if you're going to get 65% of your calories from fat, probably don't want to be doing so from things like butter. Uh, we know that's going to have an adverse effect on your lipid profile. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, with diet, we always like to say the best diet is one that you can adhere to and it's also individualized as well. That being said, there are certain things that you want to ensure that you're getting adequate amounts of if you're attempting optimization. So again, you know, going from a testosterone of 300 or 400 to 600, 700, 800. And a lot of people ask us about omega-3s, omega-6s, both technically essential fatty acids. You want to get both. In developed countries, the chance that you are not getting enough omega-6 fatty acids is extremely low. If you live in the ocean, and you are part of a, if you've been like integrated into a pod of dolphins, perhaps you have too many omega-3s and not enough omega-6s and you need to get more seed oils. But uh, the chances that uh, you live in like the United States or European country and you're not getting your essential omega-6s is exceedingly low. That being said, just like omega-3s, there's nothing inherently evil about them. 
Um, so those are some good sources of fats. And then with protein, you want to ensure that you're getting a wide variety of amino acids. If you eat meat and dairy, it's just far easier. It is possible to do if you're vegan or vegetarian. It is just more difficult to get an optimal amount. Yeah, you could certainly have a successful diet in any model that you choose. Um, and then you would just want to hedge against the risks of that. So if I'm looking at a carnivore diet, how am I going to hedge against the increase in LDL and the risk of colon cancer? Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at a vegan diet, how am I going to hedge against the risks of low iron, low B12, um, things like that that are, we know that people tend to develop deficiencies. Not every single time, but in general, you, know, you do want to keep an eye on those things if you're doing a vegetarian or especially with a vegan diet. So you can have a successful diet, you just have to be very mindful about that. and. Um, I would say that most people would have to be very careful about that. Most people are not going to have the understanding and the nuance to do something like this on their own. That's why consulting a registered dietitian can be very helpful in building out sort of your intuitive eating pattern, which is kind of what we use in place of a diet because with diet studies, we see people lose weight, gain it back. Um, intuitive eating, you know, developing habits and um, the amount of physical activity is important as well. So I think over 200 minutes per week, you see people keeping off weight more than at lower levels of exercise. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to diet strategies, one question we get a lot of, or one diet that we get asked a lot about is intermittent fasting. Um, so let's chat a bit about that. Yeah, we've talked about this a decent amount, and this is a good example of the acute effects versus the chronic effects versus the cumulative acute effects on hormonal profiles. So for some individuals, IF or intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating or however you want to look at it, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it can help decrease insulin signaling. It does slightly improve growth hormone, um, but that is more of an acute effect because then when you break the fast, it's gonna uh, kind of have the, the counteracting effect. So it's one strategy, but it's more for health reasons, so it would be more for an individual, for example, at higher risk of neoplastic disease or cancer, and not as helpful for uh, hormonal health or specifically testosterone optimization. In fact, if there's an individual that is trying to build up lean body mass and they have a slightly suboptimal, even if normal testosterone, whether this is a male or a female, um, intermittent fasting might be a counterproductive strategy. Yeah, and that's not to say that you can't put on lean body mass if you are using something like intermittent fasting, but the data that we see shows that, you know, frequent feedings, like let's say you have four meals during the day with protein in them and then some pre-bed protein, you're going to have more muscle protein synthesis and lean body mass accrual than somebody who has an equivalent amount of protein in a OMAD or, or one meal per day sort of program. Mm -hmm. So it's just important to keep the goal in mind. And something we see a lot of people doing is they, you know, maybe used to be an athlete or a bodybuilder and they used to be eating six meals a day, high protein, and then they've accumulated all the lean body mass they need. And some people are shifting towards uh, intermittent fasting for reasons like mental clarity, yep. giving their digestive tract a break, you know, potentially reducing risk for you know, cancer, although the data isn't perfectly clear there, you know, it's a potential mm -hmm. benefit and it's certainly not going to increase risk for cancer if you're reducing your feeding frequency. Um, and then with the growth hormone, it's important to remember that those short-term effects, like you know, somebody going in a sauna and getting you know, 16 times more growth hormone, is not necessarily gonna translate to 16 times more muscle growth. Um, is it good for you? you know, yeah, we're both big fans and advocates of sauna use. Um, sauna may have some anti-catabolic, if not mildly anabolic effects, which we should probably dive into in another podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but it's important to remember that it's not necessarily those small fluctuations. It's going to come down to lifestyle. So people do like to obsess over the hormones, but um, sound like a broken record, but it really does come down to lifestyle. Yep. One other note on the IF. Um, in, the, uh, in the podcast from the spring that I did, I talked about how health reasons is a great reason to do intermittent fasting for all the reasons that we've just discussed. Mm -hmm. um, there was a recent study between the podcast I did with Huberman and now, and it looked at um, intermittent fasted or time-restricted eating for weight loss. And it studied the group over a period of about, I believe it was 12 weeks. So over 12 weeks, you have 
slightly faster weight loss. But the problem with this, of course, is that they don't study past that. So if you study a VLCD or a very low calorie diet, then you also have very accelerated weight loss. And then after you go off of it to a more reasonable diet um, where you're not gonna be depleted or have other um, deleterious effects, then it's essentially identical. So if you're trying to accelerate weight loss extremely fast and you want, I believe it was an extra two pounds that they lost over 12 weeks, then intermittent fasting can still be used. But I, I still believe, and I still think the evidence is clear that IF is not a great diet for uh, losing body weight. Yeah, particularly because preserving lean muscle mass is always a goal that we have when we're working with someone losing weight or has a goal to lose weight. Um, so we touched on a bit earlier about the nuance of the blood work surrounding testosterone levels, and hormone levels in general. Um, so for women, it can be very important to make sure you're checking levels around day 21 because you really want to catch the progesterone level and, and see where that level is at in conjunction with the you know, estradiol and testosterone. Um, during ovulation would also be an interesting time to look at hormone levels because you should see a spike in estradiol and testosterone levels. Yes. Um, probably going to be attenuated, if not absent, if someone's on a, a contraceptive. Uh, but for someone who's wanting to look at their natural hormone production, um, then you could certainly check that time as well. Uh, and then for men, it's less important you know, what time of the month, of course, but uh, the time of day is particularly important. And a lot of insurance companies will you know, mandate seeing two testosterone mm -hmm. readings early in the morning on separate dates, several months apart to confirm a low testosterone diagnosis. And the early in the morning is important because if you check you know, perhaps the average person late in the evening before they go to bed, you're going to see a low testosterone level. That's the diurnal rhythm, that's normal. Um, you kind of see that ablated when someone's on a, a TRT protocol. Um, but there are some interesting regimens out there that could be, could mimic that diurnal rhythm a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we'll touch on those in a future podcast. Yeah. Um, and then you have to look at the SHBG. And one thing that we both noticed probably several years ago was the wide variation in free testosterones depending on the method that's used. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one example I've seen someone with a, you know, 600 level of total testosterone, the anagram per deciliter, and then the free testosterone, uh, one assay from the lab was seven and the other was a 17. So is that person hypogonadal or optimal? Um, and in most cases now, I'm kind of defaulting to the clinical picture and then using a calculated free testosterone based on the sex hormone binding globulin. It still is interesting to see those as assays. A lot of time they do line up when you don't yeah. see extreme outliers. If someone has a normal SHBG, you're probably not gonna see anything very abnormal there. Uh, but it's one of those things that we've kind of noticed and you know, you know we've both had patients come to us with testosterone levels of eight, 900 and very high SHBGs. And they're like, well, I, you know, I feel like I have low testosterone. My free has been low. Um, but those patients have had a difficult time trying to you know, explain what they have researched on their own to perhaps just their primary care provider who has a very short window of time to discuss that with them. Mm -hmm. So a couple notes with that, the lower your SHBG, and the younger you are, which usually correlates, the more important it is to get it very early in the morning. If you work night shifts, it's tough. There's no perfect way or time to get it. But when you're not working a night shift, so on a day that you would presumably wake up in the morning, that would be the best time to get it. If you have a very high SHBG, then you have much more stable total testosterone levels throughout the day. And then along with the labs, this is kind of more of an uh, esoteric note, but I think it'd be good for both patients and clinicians to know is that if you're only getting one free testosterone checked, then at least try to calculate a free T with an SHBG and a total T. If you are a patient or a clinician that's trying to order the most accurate one, the gold standard in general is thought of as equilibrium dialysis or equilibrium ultrafiltration. Again, we'll dive into this um, in another episode, likely with Ben. Um, uh, our pharmacist, and we'll get more into the specific specifics of that um, in more of like a, an episode directed at clinicians. Yeah, I think that would be great. And then uh, a final note and something new to introduce we didn't talk about on the previous podcast was this concept of androgen sensitivity. And this is something that you can actually test for 
there are laboratories who will run this. Um, you can do this whether you're male or female. If you're a male, you know you have one X chromosome. Um, in most cases, there are you know Klinefelters and XXY variations out there. Um, but for the average person, the average man wanting to look at their androgen sensitivity, you can measure the CAG repeat length. Um, and actually, you were the first person I heard talk about this in any kind of you know, public forum. Uh, but there's been papers scattered about for 20 plus years now. So it's really interesting to kind mm -hmm. of see the, the curve there and how this is applicable to a number of different conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and for females, it's a little bit different because they have two X chromosomes. So there's some mosaicism there is how it was described in a, a paper we were looking at recently. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily know, other than from the clinical picture, which tissues have which level of androgen sensitivity. So if you run this test on a female, you're gonna get back two numbers, two CAG repeat lengths. Yep. And then we know that the tissue in the ovaries is going to correlate pretty well with the frontotemporal skin and the hair follicles there. So yep. you see male pattern baldness in a female. It's likely that they have either high levels of androgens or a high androgen sensitivity, both the ovaries and the hair follicle there. So those are some of the interesting you know, nuances there. Uh, and we think people should know that this test is available. Does everybody need to get this test? You know, absolutely not, but it can be relevant if you wanna look at your risk for various disease states. So perhaps we chat about you know, what some of those are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your androgen receptor sensitivity can really explain a lot about your health. I remember where I was when I found out that the androgen receptor is on the X chromosome. My mind was just blown because if anything, that just shows um, a, why a lot of the differences in testosterone and how you feel on testosterone between males and females comes down to the receptor because you only have one copy as a male but two copies as a female. PCOS, of course, is one of the most common conditions where you have um, very uh, a high chance that you have the more sensitive allele or the more sensitive um, androgen receptor um, in the ovary and the skin. You see hirsutism, which is like abnormal hair growth, um, other, other sorts of androgen dominant types of PCOS. That's what I would consider Y axis PCOS, whereas X axis PCOS would be more related to insulin resistance, um, prediabetes, et cetera, obesity even. But of course, you can have both. So you can be way off on the y-axis and the x-axis at the same time. And that's kind of the, the whole point of using that plot. Um, as far as other conditions, there's also hyperthecosis, which is actually not as related to androgen receptor sensitivity. That's just where you have very high levels of androgens produced by the theca cells in the ovary. And then you can also just have um, uh, anovulatory androgen dominance. So uh, some of that can likely be changed. Um, in a variety of different ways. Some of that is altering your level of SHBG, and some of that's altering the level of the density of the androgen receptor. Yeah, and for men specifically, looking at the CAG repeat and then coronary artery disease uh, is, is a association we see. So whether or not it's direct causation is still kind of debated, but if you are an individual, you decide that you want to you know, take testosterone, but you're also looking through the lens of, I wanna have a 90 year health span or a 100 year lifespan, then you probably need to be mindful of where those levels are at in relation to your level of sensitivity to androgens. Uh, because I think there would be some interesting data there if we stratified CAG repeat length and then plaque accumulation in those with on testosterone. In general, the data seems to be pretty favorable for you know, uh, vascular event outcomes, but you do see, I think there's one study that did find a faster rate of plaque accumulation. So it'd be interesting to see if that cohort had a shorter than normal length of CAG repeat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems very likely. Again, there's nothing magical about different androgens. Um, I love the study that you brought up regarding DHT, 5-alpha reductase inhibition, and the thickening of the left ventricle in the heart. And uh, essentially, if you are sensitive to androgens and you're on very and you have lots of very strong androgens like dihydrotestosterone, then you're more prone to getting that uh, LVH, that heart disease. So it all comes down to, and we, we say this again and again, um, 
hormones, specifically androgens and estrogens as well, affect every system in the body. So you can't just be knowledgeable about the hormones themselves. You have to be knowledgeable in the hematology sphere, in the lipidology sphere, in the cardiology sphere, and be able to apply it in every single system because testosterone is not only um, affecting lean body mass and insulin sensitivity, it's also a lipid med. It's also going to induce that HMGC or reductase enzyme doing the exact opposite thing as a statin. So again, there's your balanced approach to health. Um, you're looking at every single system um, as a whole. All right, I think that is a really good overview. I think we went a little long on this one, but that's okay. I hope people enjoy it. We talked about supplements, sleep, exercise, uh, diet, nuances in blood work, um, nuances in how to look at hormones, and then androgen receptor sensitivity. So I think we covered a lot of good ground. Mm -hmm. um, and as always, be sure to let us know um, anything we did well or didn't do well in the comments. Um, let us know what your androgen receptor sensitivity is if you've had that tested. Um, we have been running a number of these tests in our clinic uh, for patients who are interested or have things mm -hmm. that are relevant to that. Um, so something out there that's a curiosity and any other take home points we have for people before we wrap things, <clears throat> before we wrap things up? I think that's about it. Um, at some point we will post on our website to where even without being a patient, you can sign up and test your androgen receptor sensitivity and um, get other various biomarkers. The average I believe is 19. Depending on um, your heritage and whatnot, of course it can vary wildly from low teens to high 20s and I believe even single digits and even in the 30s. So um, yeah, let us know what your androgen receptor CAG repeat number is. Any comments help us. As always, we appreciate your time and we hope that God will bless you and give you health and happiness. Thank you.